Okay, welcome everybody this afternoon to the, to the third of this lecture series by John Dunn uh, under the general title, Beyond the Democratic Maze. We heard last week about um, diagnosing democracy's power and then understanding democracy's assent and we're um, left with the puzzle that democracy in many ways is an idea with world historical force but when you try to pin down uh, just what that world historical force consists in uh, and what its consequences are, uh, as Professor Dunn has shown us, it's, it's an extremely uh, elusive beast. And today he's going to, I, I think, um, start um, showing us just why it is so elusive and as a prelude to um, putting our understanding on, of democracy onto a better footing uh, in tomorrow's lecture. So today's lecture is called Recognizing Democracy's Disorientation. And that, as I said, is a prelude to his Recovering Our Bearings lecture that will take place the same time tomorrow. So, Professor Dunn. Thank you very much, Ian. I, I tried to show last week a little about how and why a political idea which virtually no one thought a good idea 250 years ago and which survived principally as a cautionary tale about a keenly resented political experience ever longer ago should have come to shape so much imaginatively about the world we now live in. I'm starting off today from an intriguing and very consequential standoff between two constituents of that world. At the end of my second lecture last week, I tried to bring into focus the key elements of a momentous intellectual and political confrontation. On one side, the United States, it's a view of how governmental power can and should be built authorized and directed across the countries of the world, call it democracy, along with a relaxed confidence that that view corresponds in very large measure to the way in which power has in fact been built, authorized and directed within its own territories and for its own people for an enviably long time. What that view highlights is the authorizing potential of a process of electoral competition operating within a distinctive structure of inhibition and delay. The resulting model is very far from transparent and it's operated in very different ways over time. What is clear is that it casts very little light on how the power of the American state was in fact built, or the wealth of the American people has been created, and virtually none on how any other, as yet less fortunate population, can reasonably hope to build the power of their state, let alone augment their personal and collective wealth. On the other side of the confrontation, China, there is a rueful awareness of how governmental power was in fact built in its own case, a more comforting sense of how effectively that power has by now been directed for a good three decades and of the massive increments in wealth and military and diplomatic potency which have flowed from that direction, and an altogether more discomforting sense of the flimsiness of its authorization by anything prior to and independent of that all too recent success. For a very long time in face of the rest of the globe, the United States has reveled in its own wealth and power. It has felt no need to go in quest of either. The position of China's rulers could scarcely be more different. The authorization they now enjoy issues overwhelmingly from the spectacular scale of their all too recent success in finding and securing both. <clears throat> With the United States, 
prosperity, power, and authorization have gone hand in hand and done so almost from its outset. Many of its local ideologues are still strongly tempted to attribute its power to its prosperity and each in turn to the felicity of its secular authorization. But no minimally informed interpreter of China's experience could conceivably see it that way. In China, authorization remains a dimension of real jeopardy for the regime as a whole. Many assume, with varying assurance, that that conspicuous jeopardy is sure to prove inconsequential in practice. And if it does prove so, if economic momentum at its current velocity will authorize anything and might run on forever, China's encounters with democracy as a word or an idea might prove to carry no residual political significance. The Communist Party's invocation of Lenin's intellectual aftermath, however anachronistic at other latitudes and however jejune in rational content, may continue to endow it with all the authorization it requires. But it's still far from clear that that judgment is going to prove right. Authorization by momentum alone is notably hazardous for any regime. As soon as the momentum falters, the more squalid and brutal aspects of the basis on which it has been sustained come into sharper focus, and the appeal to other bases of identification becomes costlier to dispense with. Under those circumstances, authorization <coughs> by process gains sharply in appeal. And even a term like democracy, successfully neutered by decades of all but vacuous utilization, may alter brusquely in valency. There have been leading Chinese thinkers, some of them closely influenced by the eminently American figure of John Dewey, who have seen democracy in an essentially American understanding as a recipe for China's political future. But they've not, on the whole, been lucky in their dealings with political power. You could, I suppose, say much the same of Dewey himself. The attractions of Dewey's vision of democracy are above all its picture of a society flourishing through the active exertion and interactive intellectual energy of all its participants. A society surging with life and intelligence and constantly assailing the practical problems which come its way with all the human resources to hand. That picture assumes a society to be there in the first place, and there as a society, an assemblage of human beings already capable of recognizing one another's social membership and acting with as well as against one another. It assumes a potential order, not grounded on the coercion of some by others, and it assumes that what is there independently of coercion isn't just the state of nature. The Chinese picture, in all its historical heterogeneity, <coughs> assumes something very different. It assumes that for order to be present in human life requires its intellectual recognition and the shaping and persuasive action of those capable of that recognition. It assumes the need to teach the principles of order to those without the personal discernment to recognize them for themselves, and the need to convey to those who cannot be trusted to do the discerning for themselves the imperative to accept its being done for them by those who emphatically can. If the American vision of justified authority is horizontal and heuristic, its Chinese counterpart, with all due variation over the bewilderingly long time over which it has been deployed, is hierarchical and didactic. It assumes the need for and the potential availability of a definite apex of authority, and one which can and should force its superior insight on the rest of their fellow Chinese, and still more over the last two centuries, on those of their fellow citizens with the biological misfortune 
not to be borne harmed. <coughs> it's very difficult to think across those two spaces with any clarity and see how each bears on the other. It's also lethally prejudicial to the very attempt to do so to assume that either of space offers a privileged perspective from which to make that attempt. The single most important point about the significance of democracy's odyssey as a political formula that I want to press in these lectures is the intellectual absurdity and political menace of trying to grasp it of all political phenomena on the basis of any such privilege. But what's the alternative? Indeed, how can anyone think of anything except from their own point of view? One of my numerous drastically more distinguished predecessors as Stimson lecturer, the late Samuel Huntington, incurred a lot of contumely, as well as coming into a handsome income stream, for insisting on another occasion that civilizations have always clashed throughout human history and were rather evidently continuing to do so even today. The plentiful abuse heaped upon him was distributed fairly evenly across the presumed motives which led him to make his claim, the political damage which critics saw his insistence as certain to inflict, and the intellectually uncouth mode of thinking which they saw, with which they saw him as developing his train of thought. Democracy's odyssey, unprecedented in the history of human speech, is an object lesson in how to register the weight of the phenomena which Huntington invoked, without succumbing to either the fatalism or the chauvinism which his critics hastened to ascribe to him. As democracy at long last carries its exhilarations and vulnerabilities forward across the frontier which most preoccupied him, the demographic or political boundaries of the community of Islam, across the world, it's easier to see clearly what that passage does and doesn't mean. The inspirational surge of democracy across that frontier has not come from somewhere else. It's been there in bitter waiting and little, if any, hope for a very long time. The primal appeal and force of democracy in the form in which it has survived into the modern world lies in the moment of rejection. That is, when the people declare, as they did in the squares of Tunis and of Cairo, that what the people do not want is the regime itself. In those settings, often, however discrepant the reasons that have brought the challengers together, and however incompatible many of the purposes they hope between them to realize, what becomes hypnotically concrete is what they are choosing to reject. In that, if in very little else, the purpose which brings them together and the outcome they mean to achieve is as focused, as unitary, and fleetingly even as solidary as the political purposes of very large numbers of people ever get. For the present, however temporarily, the option against the regime is in the first place the option for democracy. Because democracy in vaguest outline is just the default option. Either the regime or democracy or chaos. Most people in downtown Cairo, as much as anywhere else, want chaos least of all. Apart from anything else, most of them live in it already. Almost none can afford it, except very briefly indeed. So either the regime or something unmistakably different, and for the present, the name for the unmistakably different is democracy, the political form of whatever the people in due course prove to want instead. Contrast that with the picture of democracy's arrival as it's natural for Americans to see it and as some of them at least did see it for a few years after 1989. In the beginning, said John Locke, very long ago, espousing a rather different ideological agenda, all the world was America. 
More than three centuries later, for democracy to have become the default option in regime change seemed, very briefly, to presage a striking global destination. In the end, at least politically, all the world might become America. America in, American in political tastes, American in its political habits, and hence American also in its ultimate allegiances. But that is scarcely what it ever could have meant for democracy to cross any frontier at all. Very much like autocracy, democracy is a self-indigenizing category. As it crosses any frontier, both by conceptual necessity and by eminently practical causality, democracy takes on the coloring of the population to which it comes. Its boast is to reflect their tastes and their choices. And sooner or later, unless it's thrust back again and expelled beyond the border, reflect them it will. The politics of Gaza are remarkably grim, and of course they have much to be grim about. But for Hamas to win its last election was not a derogation from democracy. It was what democracy, in all its dedicated aberration of judgment, at that point imperatively required. It's easiest for most of us to see the impediments to mutual understanding when others are attempting to understand us than when we strain to understand them. When Chinese officials first attempted to take in the nature of America's regime, as Jean Yuji's article makes clear, the article I referred to in the last lecture, they certainly didn't set out from the idea of democracy. Instead, they began with the question of what lay at the apex of the American state, with the fact that America lacked a monarch and had to make do instead with a mere headman. As the governor general of Yangguang province reported to the imperial court in 1817, in response to the opium smuggled in on American ships, these particular barbarians have no monarch whatsoever, only a headman. The tribe publicly selects several men who serve in succession according to the drawing of lots for terms of four years apiece. Commercial affairs are managed independently by private individuals who are not controlled or deputed by the headman. This is a search process. Two decades later, in an unsigned article on the United States of North America in the missionary-edited Eastern Western Monthly magazine, the author reported that the people rule the country themselves and once every three years elect a leader to manage governmental affairs. The following year, a more expansive article in the same periodical reported once more that the Americans did not set up a king as ruler of their country. Instead, they selected a president, vice president, and other high officials to serve for four-year terms, some improvement in targeting. The president must be attentive to the people's wishes and have a deep understanding of the arts of statecraft so as to implement benevolent governance. Thus, the regulation of the entire realm hinges on this single pivot. The chief executive Exercise control, exercises control over his subordinate officials and thereby regulates the country's notables. He keeps the various affairs of government in order and thereby pacifies the common people. The overall picture may have overlapped a little with George Washington's, but by 1838 it was a deeply Chinese vision of what the American political process had become keeping governmental affairs in order from above by controlling subordinate officials, regulating the notables, and thus pacifying the common people. Like the emperor, the president was the pivot of the entire system, and as in China, the key object was to pacify the common people. But what was already clear in this article was that in America, the common people took much more pacifying and maintained a far higher degree of surveillance on their ruler than was open to their Chinese counterparts. 
both advantages and disadvantages of these arrangements were soon recognized, even in China. And the office of president extricated from a vocabulary commonly employed to pick out village headmen, gun vote captains, or leaders of bandit gangs, and elevated to a more suitably honorific status. Within half a century, interested Chinese had left behind them a degree of ignorance which could assimilate presidential choice to the outcome of a lottery, a more prejudicial verdict on the American approach to ordering governmental affairs than even Plato chose to pass on the whimsicality of Athenian political choice, despite the ideological centrality of random selection to the Athenian practice of political equality. By that point, Chinese interpreters could readily recognize the weight of public opinion in shaping the agency of America's state. And today, plainly, very large numbers of China's population know vastly more about America's recent political history. But the sheer imaginative difficulty of holding up one set of political arrangements against the other and judging which looks best equipped to realize the political goods you value most highly hasn't noticeably lessened for Chinese observers over time. And the prospective contribution of democracy is still likelier to feature as one element in that puzzle than as a basis on which it might be solved. There's good reason to believe that the gap between American and Chinese visions of politics is wider than most such gaps between very large populations consciously aware of inhabiting the same world at the same time. It's important to recognizing the scale of that gap to see that the gap itself isn't simply the product of America's historical felicity and China's until very recently relative historical misfortune throughout most, if not all, the historical existence of the United States. Still less is it a product of the exquisite political taste with which that fortunate history has endowed America's current citizens and the miserably depleted political imagination with which China's current inhabitants, for the most part, have to make do. A more adequate way to see what has produced it is to register two things. In the first place, it's to take in the vastly greater historical depth of the Chinese vision and the consequent difficulty of reshaping it decisively and stably. China's modern historians, in this country especially, have long, I'm sure much more in China itself, have long shown in vivid and fascinating detail just how hard it proved over the long, slow 19th century for China to let go of dynastic monarchy as a form of government without consciously surrendering any sense of social value or political meaning at all. In the second place, it's to acknowledge how miserably inadequate the West's intellectual resources for understanding politics have proved for China as it struggled against the military and technical superiority first of the Western powers and then of Japan, and their cumulatively disruptive penetration of China's economy, territory, and way of life. Even to concede the superiority of a republic over a dynastic monarchy was a very hard stretch, and as in the French case, initially open to prompt reconsideration. Finding a way in which a republic could be relied on to cope with military threat, whether internal or, or external, proved impossible. The subordination of officials and the regulation of notables was scarcely even attempted, and the implementation of benevolent government lay all too evidently beyond reach. When later and more ambitious offshoots of Western political thinking arrived via Russia, and were suitably indigenized in their turn, China's luck scarcely improved. The economic expedients recommended by Russian advisors were not especially successful and have since been abandoned more or less in their entirety. Chinese improvisations in their place over three decades didn't prove a clear improvement and have mostly 
also since been abandoned. The record in subordinating officials, regulating notables, and furnishing benevolent government has been more checkered and harder to read, but it remains hard to attribute its more discouraging elements to the spurning of clear conceptions or reliable expedients of European provenance for how to structure power or hold it to benign purposes, still less ensure that its consequences would be beneficial for the great majority of China's population. But of course, China's remarkable economic transformation over the last three decades hasn't been just a lucky accident. Neither China's long history nor the cumulative intellectual acumen of the West showed China's rulers how to do what they have in fact done. Under ferocious pressure and with remarkable nerve and audacity, they worked it out for themselves. They set and sustained a framework in which scores of millions of people reshaped an economic landscape at breakneck speed and tilted the economy of the world in a new direction. It's anyone's guess how long that transformation can go on with anything like its current momentum or how far it can ever hope to repair the collateral damage it's inflicted along the way. But it has occurred and it was the political choices and exertions of the political entity which rules China which made it possible for it to do so. That entity certainly has no viable or compelling answer to the question why it should be ruling China, or why it can reasonably be expected to rule it beneficently for the foreseeable future. What it does have for the present is the mandate of heaven. In some respects, which its present leaders intermittently acknowledge, and others to which they understandably prefer to turn a blind eye, it has definitely not been ruled at all beneficently. But the people of China need China to be ruled, and like the people of everywhere else, they can't at any particular moment pick and choose the structures through which they are being ruled or will be ruled in the near future. The one opportunity in that respect, which the people of America evidently have and the people of China conspicuously lack, is the opportunity at regular intervals to pick many of the personnel in the upper reaches of their state, and most striking of all, to pick the single individual at its apex. Unlike the emperor, who was picked at least conceptually by suprahuman forces, the people of America can pick their own head man, or as it must sooner or later be, their own head woman. For all the weight of frustration and disappointment that swirls around it, that option still has some imaginative centrality in American understandings of democracy and still retains its evanescent gratifications. What is gratifying about it isn't the predictable benefit, individual or collective, of the consequences of exercising it. It is the immediacy of personal choice itself. There's no reason whatever to suppose that China's citizens would not enjoy exercising that choice as much as any other citizens. But there's nothing in China's protracted prior history to give them grounds to believe that exercising their choice will prove a good recipe for ensuring that the head man selected will shape China's state agency for the best. When they first sought to fathom the American approach in the 19th century, George Washington looked to some quite a good proxy for an emperor. But that was a very long time ago, and the vicissitudes of more recent presidents do not and should not suggest a comparable capacity to impart order to America's turbulent political processes. Leaving the choice of head man to the discernment of the people is not a strategy which instantly recommends itself in Beijing. It's not a natural practical inference from China's millennial political history or from the intellectual history so closely impacted upon it. <clears throat> 
I've labored the last point at such length because the mutual political comprehension of China's and Americans, polit America's political elites matters so intensely at present. I want now to turn to the challenge to mutual political intelligibility posed by another great Asian state, the Republic of India. If there are any democracies in the world today, if the term democracy isn't simply a misnomer when applied to any extant state, the Republic of India is far the largest democracy there has ever been. It's also, in some ways, the most surprising democracy there's ever been. Surprising in its scale, in its persistence amongst a huge and for, the mo for most of its existence predominantly exceedingly poor population, and in its tensile strength in face of fierce centrifugal pressure and high levels of violence, corruption, and human oppression throughout most of its existence. Why is it still there as a continuous legal, political, organizational, and civilizational structure? Why does it still cover its present territorial extension and continue to hold the huge human population which still lo lives upon that territory? Why is it still valued so highly by so many of its own citizens, miserably poor as much as enviably wealthy, in face of levels of corruption and criminality across its political class, which must be as high today as they've ever been since the Republic's founding, and in face of levels of violence deeply embedded in its social, economic, and religious relations, which even six decades of purposefully remedial constitutional rule in any number of elaborate programs of legal, economic, and social reform have largely failed to pacify. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of the fact that it is still there. It's also hard to imagine what doc democracy's future would look like if the Republic of India had continued to disintegrate in the wake of the initial partition of Britain's Indian Empire, or even if the residue of that empire had in due course gone the way of Pakistan. The sheer fact of that survival has shown two things very clearly. The extraordinary absorptive capacity of democracy as a political category and its severely limited capacity to impose order on chaos and pretty muted inclination even to attempt to do anything of the kind. If there is inspiration in its tumultuous journey, as there unmistakably is, there's also at least equivalent chastening, high romance alongside very grim realism. The best way for the present, I think, to see the balance between the two synoptically is to read attentively through Ramachandra's Guha's wonderfully generous and unconcessive history, India after Gandhi one of the best political histories of any country in the world over the last um, 75 years. What's made it possible for India's republic to last for a full six decades is a number of elements in its legacy from British imperial rule and from the lengthy and profound struggles to escape from that rule. The principal legacy from imperial rule itself was essentially common to the two initial successor states. But the legacy from the struggles against it was distributed altogether less symmetrically. It's tempting accordingly, especially for Indians, to attribute the divergence in democracy's fortunes in those two states to the weaker and less edifying political resources of Jinnah's Muslim League and the cumulative nationalist achievement of the Congress Party and its great leaders, especially in their very different ways to Mohandas Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Vallabhai Patel. The record of India's subsequent political leaders has been both more checkered and more ordinary, though it certainly encompasses intervals, very considerable personal achievements, and at least one of them, for better and for worse, was a very notable political leader indeed. But what stands out with the benefit of hindsight is how singularly fortunate 
India's Republic was in its founders. In the imaginative scale and intensity which Gandhi had given to the quest for nationhood across so many hundreds of millions of people before nationhood was won, the vision, patience, and political courage of Nehru in defining sovereign nationhood as he went along, and the massive political realism and good sense of Patel when the time came to assume it. It was a great political feat to turn the scruffy palimpsest of empire into a cohesive territorial state in relatively steady control over most of its subsequent history of borders which were often intensely vulnerable both from the outside and from within. It was a great political feat to recreate a semblance of civic order across most of that territory through the grim and bloody aftermath of partition and recompose it time and again in face of decades of bitter economic, caste, and communal conflict in an endless variety of settings. There was no overriding reason why India should not have split and re-split endlessly through one secession after another, as may yet happen with Pakistan and began to do so decades ago with the creation of Bangladesh. The reason why India didn't go that way is not well focused even today. It's in part certainly a consequence of the scale and character of the Indian army and the pride it's contrived to sustain in face of pressing personal temptations in placing the constitutional integrity of the state above the gratification of individual ambition and corporate self-advancement. It's in part a product of the prodigious administrative reach of the Indian state for all its bureaucratic clumsiness and rigidity and its fluctuating commitment to legal responsibilities, a reach most evocatively shown in the stunning complexity and punctiliousness of its electoral rituals and the unique political standing of their emblematic institution, the Electoral Commission of India. It's certainly in part also a product of the depth of thought through political construction embodied in its constitution making and the stamp which that placed on the continuing project of a rule of law which might readily have been vitiated irretrievably by its imperial provenance or by cynical deflection into the subsequent convenience of a varyingly beleaguered or appropriative executive. Within the frame of India's republic, those resources have to a striking degree worked together and not as they quite readily might have done and have necessarily in fact done from time to time worked more or less lethally against one another. There have been times of great peril in enabling them to do so, notably the period of Indira Gandhi's emergency, but also with partition right at the beginning, recurrently with Jammu and Kashmir, with the traumas of Amritsa, the poison flooding out from Ayodhya, and the endless miseries of Bihar and the hapless rural backlands which have subsequently succeeded to its mantle. You can also question the felicity of their consequences. Ask how far they have worked to the net benefit of a very large proportion of India's population at any point in its history. And also question equally as you can in any capitalist democracy, how far such benefits as have accrued from their working for that huge population have been augmented or depleted by the operations, more specifically, of India's democratic institutions. If the latter had worked very substantially worse, it's reasonable to assume that that would have greatly impaired the appeal of those institutions. And no doubt of their consequences for the wealth and standard of living of a clear majority had been very much handsomer, that too would have ingratiated democracy as a political principle more urgently to more of India's citizens. But if you tried to trace out systematically how those consequences have in fact accrued, their net impact is still hard to read. Since its Athenian heyday, democracy has had more flair and animus when it comes to distribution than when it comes to production. 
Some of the distributive gains of the conspicuously badly off in given settings have been traceable unequivocally to the democratic bargaining within Indian political institutions and to explicitly articulated rectificatory purposes. In those respects, it's hard to see how democratic institutions could vindicate themselves more conclusively. The long, slow struggle to offset the accumulated historical oppression of the lower castes, untouchables, and tribals, with the spiritual authority of Gandhi behind it and the shaping impact of B.R. Ambedkar, both in the drafting of the Constitution itself and throughout his long political career, certainly generated anomalies of its own along the way. But it, too, has been as serried and admirable a project of rectifying a vast historical injustice as human history can plausibly point to. In it, too, democracy has carried a large proportion of the burden. And if it's scarcely to India's credit as a civilizational site, still less to the credit of the British Empire, that the new republic inherited so much to rectify, it's hard to think of an attributable outcome of democracy in operation which is so unequivocally to its credit. For all the often deeply unpleasant cautionary tales which disfigure it, the record of India's democracy as a whole forms a single giant political achievement and one which has already had an immense impact on the political imaginations of other countries and may yet have very much more. If we press the question of why that achievement has been effective, besides the historical legacies which made it possible and the wide range of political actions through which it was reached and secured, there's something else left over which is central to the theme I've been trying to explore. The special Indian engagement with democracy as a category and the wealth and heterogeneity of the potential which Indians have elicited from their romance with that category and their explorations of it. That should be a theme with a special resonance for an American audience, both for the opportunity it offers for widening imaginative sympathy and for the instructive complement it provides to America's own very rather different romance with an exploration of the category. The Indian tale as yet has been told more fruitfully and less illuminatingly than the American, if for somewhat different reasons. But this protracted inaudibility from the outside, and in part, I think, even within India itself, is beginning at last to come to an end. And the story of India's political thinking from the 20th century onwards is now being told with increasing confidence and intimacy as a cumulative record of political experience and even political learning. It's yet to be joined convincingly to an understanding of India's long intellectual past, the cumulative riches, especially of classical Sanskrit learning and the proliferation of vernaculars across the subcontinent. But joined in due course, it is going to be. And when it is, there's no reason why India's dramatic political experience should look or feel any less coherent than the political experience of America, or France, Britain, or Germany, Japan, or dare one say it, China itself. And in India's political experience, whatever will be true by then for Japan or China, or indeed Germany or Britain, neither of whose experiences, after all, still appears especially exemplary, democracy is certainly go still going to be the master category. It isn't just that India's national elections, each time they occur, are always the biggest democratic elections there have ever been. It's also that democracy's adventure in India is still the greatest adventure on which that endlessly untransparent category has yet to launch itself. You can see that adventure from several different angles, at a minimum intellectual, organizational, heuristic, and coercive. To do it any justice, you must at least try to see it each of those ways and then put the different trajectories across each of them together. <laughs> 
Especially you must do so if you hope to extricate your own understanding of democracy from the necessarily parochial framing in which you inevitably have formed it. On the Indian subcontinent, and since independence, particularly in India itself, more women and men have peered into democracy's mirror and strained to take in what they see than have done so anywhere else. True, initially they did so on a more modest scale than the immigrant population of this country has chosen to over the last two or three centuries. I doubt if the term democracy can be shown to have reached India before the 18th century at the earliest. That might be false, of course, but I, I do doubt it. That's true about me. But it remains a very deep question how far the idea and practice of democracy had featured in the texture of Indian society and the workings of Indian imaginations as far back as, or even further, than it can plausibly be seen to appear in any European society. Just how that immemorial, if shadowy, presence was to relate to, inform, and constrain India's destiny and capabilities as an independent state was a central issue of judgment and allegiance for the nationalist movement from quite early in the 20th century. It very much remains such, however confusedly, as the society as a whole faces the future today. You can think of the presence of democracy in India simply as the current form of its state. But you can also think of it, and may do so with greater sympathy, as many Indians emphatically do, as the diffuse set of practices elaborately dispersed across the social landscape which make up India's civil society at all levels from villages to political or commercial capitals, endlessly reinserting itself between government and individual citizen and tussling away to soften coercive impacts on those worst placed to defend themselves and buoy up the facilities to support those most abjectly in need as well, undoubtedly, as pursuing a prodigious variety of other and rather less edifying goals. It's easy for the denizens of each of those settings, rulers and activists alike, to view their mutual relations in zero-sum terms as a ceaseless struggle for dominance. But it defies the sense of democracy either as a term or as an idea to see their relation that way. In each setting and from each angle, the demos, or those who fondly identify themselves with, the interest, with its interests and so with it, the demos judge or act as best they can on its behalf and with its presumptive authority. If you disapprove of what they choose to do, you're unlikely to view that more charitably because of the authority they invoke. But whatever facilities it may offer for self-deception and whatever abuses it can cynically be put to, you can't reasonably deny that the category of democracy is open to both interpretations and that something of normative and political significance and value is captured in each. To misapply a political category is never to invalidate it. There are no political concepts or categories capable of carrying validity which can't also be more or less grossly misapplied. One of the lessons we most urgently need to learn about democracy is how readily and unresistingly it can be misapplied and how practically contradictory, even perfectly defensible applications of it can readily prove. That's the simple intuition which my, which my overall title is aimed, as well as the covert theme of much of this lecture. I hope you're beginning to pick up the plot line. If you look at democracy's adventure in India as a highly populated passage of intellectual history, there are several different sequences to which you would have to attend and an increasingly crowded canvas as you move towards the present and try to peer forward beyond it. Two of those sequences can be traced in exemplary fashion in the work of one of your present teachers, Karuna Mantana, and especially in her superb book, Alibis of Empire. The first, the inherent contradictions of liberal imperialism 
was at first uh, an Occidental intrusion, an aspiring remedy for the blatantly untoward profile of unapologetically pre-liberal imperialism. The long shadow of Warren Hastings, or at least the spectre of his rule, passed on by Edmund Burke to Britain's political class. <coughs> Liberal imperialism at all points was a project rather than a plausible historical description of governmental practice. Imperial rule as a favor for those at the receiving end. Humanitarian intervention for the very long haul. Its totemic exponent, John Stuart Mill, classic theorist of democracy as collective self-education for those he deemed up to it, firmly denied its applicability to pre habermasian social time. <coughs> As Mill himself put it, any state of things anterior to the time mankind have become capable of being improved by free and equal discussion. He, pre habermasian of course, wasn't Mill's praiseology, but I think you would agree that that is actually a correct labeling. He based his analysis firmly on the contrast between civilization and barbarism, with the former defined by human beings acting together for common purposes in large bodies and fully capable of reciprocation and hence of rule following, <coughs> and the latter briskly inverting the assessment and hence requiring direct subjection by the more advanced. Mill himself was serenely confident in the quality of his own intellectual and political judgment, seeing the main point of superiority in the political theories of the present as their acceptance that the institutions through which a population is ruled need to be radically different according to the stage of advancement already reached. And taking his cue from his own father's precept that no scheme of government can happily conduce to the end of government unless it's adapted to the state of the people for whose use it is intended. It's easy today to sneer at Mill's complacency over the imperial element in the ways he and his father chose to spend their lives. It's hard, too, not to enjoy his merciless pillorying by James Fitzstone Stephen for the vision of Britain's Indian Empire as based on a moral duty on the part of the English nation to try to educate the natives in such a way as to lead them to set up a democratic form of government administered by representative institutions. And Stephen's challenge, why what was good enough for Charlemagne and Akbar in their emphatically coercive dealings with backward states of society shouldn't carry through to the relations between the educated and the uneducated back in Britain itself. But it's dangerous to sneer too readily. We've scarcely left the dilemmas of liberal imperialism comfortably behind us. And if we shrink from employing the criterion of advancement explicitly any longer, we direly need a less condescending proxy for its strictly pragmatic counterpart. What clear and reliable advances have we yet made in discerning how to enable failed states to succeed or to induce states without either capacity or inclination to civilize their subjects to set about the arduous struggle to do so? How much more robustly directive is our own theory of how to civilize the world than Mills has proved to be. It's especially important to register that question since however haphazardly and in the teeth of Stephen's sneer, there's a clear sense in which by independence, Britain's Indian administrators had at least enabled enough Indians to educate themselves in such a way as led them to set up precisely a democratic form of government administered by representative institutions. That form of government is still there today, and it was the clear choice in the end of the main strand in India's nationalist movement that it should be. And they made that choice through very extensive argument and often bitter conflict over quite a long time. That is the third of the sequences you would need to trace as intellectual history to grasp the full impact of democracy on India. As I've already tried to suggest, it's also proved the most momentous. 
Even with the privilege of hindsight, that option still comes out as India's largest strictly political resource in establishing and sustaining the most astonishing democracy there has yet been. It's the second sequence on which Karuna Mantan has concentrated most of her work so far. She begins from a deep intellectual reaction to Mill's viewpoint, prompted in large part by dismay at the evident fragility of imperial rule in the wake of the 1857 uprising, a favor flamboyantly unrecognized as such by its recipients. The reaction pivoted on the intellectual work of Sir Henry Mayne, who recast the viceregal image of India and helped to transform much of the sophisticated European sense of what a society really consists in by doing so. He focused on India's innumerable villages and the complex practices which sustained them, saw in their beleaguered residual autonomy a balance between promise and danger, and set out to try to guide his imperial colleagues in the formidable assignment of shoring up the promise and controlling the danger. Movingly, and for reasons we still do not clearly understand, Maine's remarkable reorientation of the imperial mind set up intricate resonances between European and in due course American efforts to rethink the modern state as an intricate and gratuitously overconfident pseudo-totality in necessarily and deservedly limited control of a burgeoning array of sub-state institutions, many of which have long preceded it and had distinctly better prospects of operating coherently from the point of view of their human participants. The European wing of that movement of thought, pluralism, did not itself, um, for the most part, set out from Maine. It came and then very largely went over a few decades, though it's recently begun to seep back, at least in academic circles. Its American wing never encountered the same level of resistance from admirers or would-be deployers of the state and has remained a fairly steady presence throughout. But in India itself, in quite direct response to Maine and many of the realities of Indian society, it figured dramatically in shaping the Swadeshi element in the nationalist movement, inspired a highly distinctive vision of India's realities and possibilities centered on tilting power, initiative, and social hope back from state centers towards the villages and generated some of the most striking imaginative moments in India's modern intellectual history. From Ramachandra Mukherjee's Lucknow School of Sociology and his 1921 study in comparative politics, Democracies of the East, to the mesmerizing figure of Mohandas Gandhi and the great champions of India's indefatigably still burgeoning civil society from 1949 up to today. It also joined India's politics to the intricacies of its enduring religious heritage more richly and promisingly than the legions of electoral politicians who have since traded on the claim to do so since the spoils of office came within reach. It cannot be said that that remarkable inspiration has ever achieved a tight grip on the performance of its inveterate and often immediate enemy, the Indian state. But that was a victory plainly precluded from the start. If it's scarcely facing a kinder ecology in the near future, as India's growth rate accelerates at last and her leading capitalists loom ever larger and perhaps ever less scrupulous, it's also by now clear that the presence it has assumed across Indian society is too dense and pervasive for there to be any chance that its voice will simply die away. The scale of democracy's impact on India raises pressing questions both for Indians themselves and for the rest of the world's inhabitants. For Indians, the most important judgment is how on balance the impact has come out. For the rest of us, the key question is what it shows about the political properties of democracy as a category 
and its capacity to survive and root itself in different settings and then direct the political energies of their inhabitants for the better. We can judge the answers to both questions best by pressing the question of what democracy has done for the Indians. The criteria here aren't elusive. How far has it aided and impeded them in their individual and collective quests for wealth and power? How successfully has it reconciled a society in which every adult member is deemed fully fit to judge and act politically for themselves to and with the dizzying injustice of so much of its own past, or aided it to recompose its totemic hierarchies of caste and brutal chasms of class into a community of real equals? How far in addressing each of those exacting and arguably fantastical goals has it equipped the citizens of India to recognize and respond to their ever more pressing need to preserve and restore a viable habitat in which to do so? How safely and securely has it woven those tasks together so that none disappears from sight or suffers irreparably from prioritizing the others? By those standards, has Indian democracy proved a good idea or has it proved a strikingly bad one? That's the note on which I meant to end. But there's one thought now I'd like to add, one which bears on Karuna Mantana's conference on ends and means this Friday. If you answer the question of how far India's democracy has been a good idea by applying to India as it is today the criterion of liberal cosmopolitan right, you will have to concede that Indian democracy has proved a fairly complete flop. But if you ask what would have, you have the same result if you apply to the United States, incidentally, but if you ask what would have been needed to be done politically and indeed militarily to turn the Indian palimpsest of independence into a normative tabula rasa, undisquieting to cosmopolitan liberal taste, you would have to recognize the ferocity and the utter abandonment of inhibition needed to carry through that vast and giddy transformation. Fear all ends in politics dictate their own means, and no means in politics are either liberal or democratic independently of what can be done and of what the consequences of doing it will prove to be. Democracy in India has not proved an especially liberal idea, but what it has proved in active political use over time is a strikingly democratic idea. <laughs>